today we have lined up. Uh, Sorry, John. Been... Sorry, John. Can we just have a quick call for no cameras, please? Got one remaining on. So, so yeah. If if you do wish to um, keep your bandwidth, you can turn your camera off Thank slightly. You. But um, there's thanks, Tracy. So today's event is I've loosely called future threats, although actually these diseases are with us in the southwest today as we speak. Um, we have uh, just two speakers, but three topics. Um, so the, the first speaker uh, joining us from Forest Research, uh, one of the leading experts in the country is, is Anna Bresciera to talk about Swiss needle cast, which is affecting uh, Douglas fir. Um, we first picked that a couple of years ago. And then a double stint uh, from Mick uh, about Swiss chestnut, uh, Swedish sweet chestnut blight. And then our old favourite Phytophthora, just to sort of tell us where we are with that. Um, we'll take a few questions as we go, and then any time left over at the end, uh, we will have uh, just a, a Q and A to take us to the ninety minutes. So, if I could now uh, invite Anna to uh, to take the floor and join us. Hi. Welcome, Anna. Great to have you with us. Thank you for for your time. Thank you for inviting me as well. Thank you. OK, then uh, I'm going to open my presentation. Um, if I share this, let's see. Yeah, so just pop it into presentation view. Looks good. Is that OK? It's great. OK, then uh, hi, everybody. Um, Yes, uh, I'm going to talk about Swiss needle cast, and um, this uh, this disease is caused uh, by a fungus, and the fungus name uh, is Notophaga cryptopus gaumenii. I'm not going to ask you to remember that or to repeat that at any time. Don't worry. Uh, it, it's only recently that changed its name, and pro probably you have seen it before as Phaeocryptopus gaumenii. Um, this uh, fungus is uh, specific, it's one host or, uh, within uh, Pseudosuga. It we, is specific to uh, Douglas fir and also the big cone uh, Douglas fir that is, uh, is also affected, that is Pseudo, Pseudosuga macrocarpa. And then about this disease, um, it was first observed on Douglas fir in the 1920s. Then it's not a new disease. This fungus has been around for a very long time. And it was detected in Europe, in Switzerland and Germany. And it was called Swiss needle cast. Then here is where the name comes from. However, they discovered later on that the, uh, the disease was endemic in uh, Western uh, uh, North America. Then uh, they also found it in herbarium material from uh, the 1916. Uh, then basically, uh, although it's called Swiss needle cast, it's actually endemic to uh, across the sea in the Americas. Uh, is present this fungus is present uh, where Douglas fir uh, is grown and. Uh, at the beginning, when they discovered this fungus, they they were not very worried about it. It wasn't causing a lot of damage. And for a long time, it was considered like a minor disease, uh, just affecting Douglas fir that was not growing uh, in the natural range. Then in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, it became a problem on the Christmas tree plantations. And this is quite confusing for me because the, what the uh, Christmas trees for them is Douglas fir. Obviously, for me, Christmas tree is a different species in, in, in Europe, uh, but they, are, they call it Christmas tree. And uh, it, it became, uh, it was a problem in the 1960s and 1970s. And in the 1980s, uh, when they did some surveys, they found that 84% of the tree surveys, they were diseased. Uh, this was, uh, as a result, they have uh, important economic losses for growers, and they have significant losses in plantations, and it was the post-harvest quality was reduced. It's also present in foreign stands, and since the 1990s, it has become an issue uh, of concern 
uh, especially in Douglas Fir in Western Oregon and Washington. Then they started, as I said, this uh, concern started in the 1950s, in the 1990s, and the aerial surveys started in 1996. And just to show you, this is uh, from, I, I'm giving you here the, the link, you can access this information. They have lots of studies about Swiss needle cast in Oregon and Washington. And this is just to show from the aerial surveys that were conducted from 1996 to, the, this is the latest figure I found, to 2018, and the incidence, uh, the area of Douglas fir forest with symptoms uh, that was detected during the aerial surveys. You can see from the 1990s, we have a very, um, the, be aware that there is in acres, not in hectares. Um, you can see the uh, up and down and how it's increasing progressively uh, over time. You can see how the, the, is the number of infected trees is increasing. And it's very um, climate driven. And we will see in a minute what is um, driving the, this uh, fungus or what conditions are conducive uh, for, for this fungus. Then this is a situation where we have a fungus that is endemic that is not causing much damage, but over time, conditions change and then it becomes a problem. And then just to show, this is uh, from some of the areas in Oregon and uh, state where you, you have uh, the yellow dots here indicate uh, moderate symptoms uh, and crown thinning, where you can see the red dots over time uh, are it becoming more increasing. If you look to the uh, in 2009, you can see a stance that they are severely affected. What they look like from the sky, this is what they look like. And basically is what we are going to see is chlorotic trees, very poor growth, uh, crown thinning. And I'm going to show you now uh, a, a little bit more about this fungus and a close-up of the symptoms and how can you recognize uh, this disease. Then, as I said, the fungus is, uh, I told you the name, Nothofaracryptopus gaumenii, and is widely distributed through the natural range of Douglas fir. And the, the fruit bodies of, of the fungus, you can, I mean, with a hand lens, you can see it very well. Uh, with your, you can, intuitive see the, the fruit bodies of the fungus on the uh, underside of the needles and they are black fruit bodies. They, they, it's very easy to see them because they come in, in rows as you can see on the underside of, of, the, of the needles and you can see normally you see these two rows of black um, fruit bodies. Uh, as I said normally you can see it with your naked eye, sometimes you need to have the, the hand lenses. Then this uh, disease develop uh, from uh, when these fruit bodies uh, emerge from the stomata of the needle. And what happens is these uh, fruit bodies, they block the stomata of the needle. And therefore, the assimilation of CO2 is limited and then they become uh, chlorotic. And when you have certain number of stomata occluded by these fruit bodies, then the needle will fall, will shed. Then this is quite characteristic. Uh, if you looked on the underside of the needle to see these two rows of black fruit bodies uh, on the underside. Then defoliation uh, occurs. As I said, you may have this fungus and uh, maybe you cannot see the symptoms. However, if you have the fungus and you have the conducive uh, conditions for the fungus, then you will have the defoliation. Then what are the conducive conditions? Uh, it's very important to have uh, precipitation or rain or fog in a spring and early summer. This is needed during the bud break and needle expansion because without this, the, the spores of the fungus cannot be dispersed. Also, we need to have a wetness on the leaf for the spores to survive to germinate and to penetrate the needle. About temperatures, uh, the most favorable, favorable uh, temperatures are when we have mild uh, winter temperatures. And we are talking about temperatures maybe four or eight degrees in, uh, in winter. 
we know that the fungus uh, below zero or above 30 degrees normally doesn't grow. Then what are the symptoms? As I said, you have the fungus, it's colonizing the, the needles, blocks the stomata and the needles go chlorotic and they de the decrease uh, of retention. As soon as you touch, infected needles will drop. They will shed the needles. And what you have is very sparse crowns and leading eventually to very poor growth and changes in wood density and other wood properties due to the increased proportion of late wood. With this disease, mortality is rare. Then when, are, when is you likely to see the symptoms? The symptoms are more evident in the spring uh, before bad break. And normally, when they conduct uh, aerial surveys, they do it during this time. And it's normally late April or early May, uh, as I said, when the symptoms are, are visible. But it's between May and July where we are going to see uh, very clearly the symptoms. These are some photographs of, of the, the symptoms, very chlorotic trees, as we can see on this uh, picture on the left. Uh, you can see some affected trees here also on, on the right. And you can see uh, that you have the, the New Year's needle there. They may look healthy and it's the second or third year that they are affected and will drop. This uh, again is the typical symptoms you may see. You will see uh, the new growth green and healthy and the second, third year uh, growth that is yellowing or browning, as you can see in these pictures. And again, this is uh, another tree affected. You can see the, the green tips of the trees, but as you go in a, into the foliage, you will see the uh, second or third year needles affected. First going yellow, then brown. As I said, this, uh, when you have this disease, the growth is also affected and it can be reduced between 15 and 50% of the growth. And in some, this data I have on this slide is obviously from studies done in, uh, in Oregon and uh, Washington. And in young plantations, uh, they, they have that, for example, the height of growth was reduced by 25% and the basal area by, 30, by 35% uh, in heavily infected stands. And this obviously leads to reduction of uh, volume uh, growth. Uh, in some severe sites, uh, they have growth reduction approaching 85%, and some trees they can show almost like 10 or more missing growth rings. They, it can have a big impact in growth. Uh, I'm going to just touch on, on the cycle because it's interesting to know uh, how, how it works. And, I put the link here on this slide. You, this is now my, my diagram. I just took it from uh, one of the American websites. And basically, it's very important to understand how the fungus works. Uh, when the expanding needles uh, uh, after bad break, uh, is, this is the time when the, the, the needles are going to be infected by the spores of the fungus. These spores are released from all the needles. Then the infection normally occurs uh, in May or June on the new needles. However, uh, this period may be uh, longer if we have uh, rain, for example, it may be extended till July. Then between May and July is when the infection occurs. The ascospores of the fungus are released and infect the needles. However, even that the needles are infected, we are not going to see any symptoms on these needles. These needles uh, will start showing any symptoms maybe by October or November uh, on that year. Normally, they are infected one year and you will see the symptoms the following year. Then the needle, as I said, they will be infected, but no symptoms till the following year. And then in the second year is where you are going to see obviously the, the infected needles and you are going to have uh, the leaf, uh, the needle shedding uh, from the second year and obviously into the third year. When um, 
when the needles drop, the growth of the fungus stops. Then leaf, um, needle litter is not a source of inoculum. Then this is uh, again, um, this is data from uh, America uh, in the Pacific Northwest. We know that Swiss needle cast is very severe in low to mid elevations, normally south facing, with abundant spring precipitation and mild winter temperatures. This is key. And when you have more arid uh, conditions, you don't have the disease is no severe. Or sometimes you may have the fungus, and as I said, you don't. If the conditions are not conducive, you may not have severe disease symptoms at all. In some cases, uh, in heavily infected trees, you may have um, that the crown you will see only the one uh, year uh, needles because the other ones they have dropped, and it's this kind of lion tail effect that you can see in this photograph. Uh, this, when this happens, um, what ha uh, the light enters more into the tree and you may see that the branches below, uh, they are larger than they should be. As, has, as I said at the beginning, this disease is driven uh, by climate. Then when you have warmer uh, winter temperatures and wet springs and early summers, then you have an intensification of the disease. Also, there is variation in Douglas fir individuals and provenances, but all of them are susceptible to infection. About management, I'm not going to go into management, but I wanted to put this slide here, and uh, you will have it if you have this uh, later on, where they have been trying different approaches uh, to control this disease, and none of them had been very successful apart from trying alternative uh, species. For management and for information about this disease, I would recommend the already mentioned websites, also this one that I mentioned here uh, from Oregon, and there is a, a, a leaflet uh, that is quite useful for uh, getting information. Then now I come to tell you something, where is this happening here? Um, and the recent detections we have here, uh, we have, as you can see, in the south, we have a couple of findings in Wales, uh, but, you know, it's mainly, we have it in the south of the, the country, mainly the southwest, although we have some findings on the southeast. And what I would like to ask you is if you, if you see uh, something uh, that you think, oh, it could be uh, Swiss needle cast, I will ask you to report it. Report it through tree alert. Um, if you report it through tree alert, we may ask you to collect samples. And we, if we ask you to collect samples, uh, we have to be aware that uh, when you are going to collect the samples, the needles will drop. And this is as soon as you, the even the, the effect of cutting the branch, the, all the needles will drop and please place a plastic bag below the branch you are collecting the sample from because if not we will lose all the infected needles. And just to finish, uh, I wanted to say that we do have other fungi uh, also in England on Douglas fir, on the, on, on especially some of them on the needles I want to mention or on the shoots. Then. This is a list of fungi that we normally find, but I wanted to mention a few of them because you may see these conditions, and if you see them, I would like you to report them if possible. One of them, the first one here, this is a killing of the shoots on Douglas fir. This was a Botrytis a cinerea, and I, although I isolated only Botrytis from these trees, I suspect Cirococcus is another fungus is present, but I couldn't confirm it. The only thing I could isolate from these trees was botrytis. Then this was, uh, you will see dying shoots quite uniform in the tree. Uh, Heterobacidium anosum is another of the problems you may find on, on young uh, Douglas fir, especially if it's grown after pine. Phytophthora could be another problem you may find on young plantations. Um, Another needle cast disease is uh, Rhabdoclinis pseudosugi, and this is a bit different uh, because you will have this kind of brown marking on the needles, 
and if you turn them around, the fungus, uh, the, you will see the epidermis of the needle opening like a window, and you will see the fungus inside. Um, and there is another fungus, and this is why I wanted to mention this one, because there is another fungus that it looks identical, and I mean it. it this is another fungus. You will tell me this is similar to what I showed you a few minutes ago, and it's not. This is another fungus. The only way to distinguish this fungus, Rhythosphaera calcophii, from Swiss needle cast is because we need to look to the spores under the microscope. And you can see these are the spores here, the blue ones, these little ones, are the spores of Rhythosphaera calcophii, that they are one single cell, where the ones for, from Nothophyacrectopus gaumeniae, they are two cell. You see, they're like two cell spores. And uh, this is the only way we can distinguish them is in the, in the laboratory. And the last one I wanted to show is another one, another shoot uh, blight or shoot dieback on Douglas fir. This is caused by Diplodia sapinea, and this is also common in England. And if you have any, or if you see any of these symptoms, uh, please, I would, I, I would ask if you could report it through Tree Alert. Um, and nothing from me. Um, thank you very much. Great. Great. Thank, you. thank you very much, Anna. Um, there have already been a couple of questions in the chat that you answered them as you went. <laughs> so um, similarity to, to others um, and whether it was present in the UK, but uh, like I say, you, you did pick those up. So I would, if people have any more questions, please do put them in the chat now. I've got one question for you, which is, um, I've asked you to talk about the Swiss needle cast rather than the other diseases that you mentioned there. Um, do you think that Swiss needle cast will become an increasing problem in the southwest? It's, with the climate, it could be. Uh, it's, that's why I'm, I'm very interested to, to see and uh, cases to be reported, because it was two years ago that suddenly we had uh, an increase of number of reports, and then this is what we need to watch. Uh, because, as I said, we have the, the fungus is here. It's not causing a lot of damage because we don't have the best conditions. However, uh, it could be that in time it could become an issue, especially we are replacing pine because of the stroma with Douglas fir in the south. And uh, we are changing the host. And as the host become more prevalent and the conditions, mm, if the conditions are conducive, Potentially, yes, it could be an issue. That's what I, I would say. If anybody see any symptoms that they are worried about, just report it because it will help us to kind of have the bigger picture of what is happening. Um, that will be very useful. Great, thank, thank you. you. I've put the link to Tree Alert in the chat if, uh, if uh, people would like to see that. There's a uh, hand has gone up. I, can't see. Oh, Mick, it's your hand. Um. Hi. Thank, thank, thanks, um, John and Anna. Yeah, just um, <clears throat> uh, observation. Am I, whilst I've been going around the southwest for the last couple of years, really, um, I've become more aware of Swiss needle cast. And I think that it's, that it's largely unreported or underreported in the southwest. Um, so, Someone mentioned that they, they're, they're based in Wiltshire. I've seen some pretty ropey looking Douglas fir stands in, in Wiltshire as I've been going driving around. Um, yesterday I was in Dorset, uh, down near the south coast, um, and on a forestry commission site there. And there's, I've got some photographs and I've got a sample in the fridge you'll be delighted to hear, Anna, um, that I'll send over. But that looked terrible in terms of the, the, the foliage and the defoliation on this um, on this site in, in Dorset. So I'll send that report on to you, Anna. Um, but yes, I, again, I, I'd uh, ask people to, to report it if they have suspicions. Thank you very much, yes. And the best time um, to identify it, as I said, is between May and July. And 
we know um, our colleagues in, I showed the data from America, but our colleagues in Belgium, they have been trapping spores of the fungus and they can confirm that is definitely in June, July is the peak. Then between May and July, please have a, a look. You will see clearly the rows of black fruit bodies on the underside of the needles. And uh, they will be chlorotic or brown, and it will be, as I said, second or third year needles. Then that will be your, your clue. Okay, yeah, thank you. So the, the mess take home message there is have a look at the, the trees. Anything that looks unhealthy, put it on tree alert, um, and then we can, we can investigate it further. Okay, so if there's no further questions, I mean, yeah, there should be time at the end for, for any other questions, but um, if we could now uh, invite Mick to speak. Mick, there has just, there's a comment in the chat, but I did notice as well, you're a little bit echoey. Is there anything you could sort of do to try and tweak the, the sound? How is that? That's a bit better, yeah. That's I wonder good. if somebody's uh, microphone is on, if it's, there's a bit of feedback. Coming around. Is that any better? That is that is a slightly better, yeah. Let's that's good. Let's go with that. So and then if people could just keep themselves on mute now, that's great. So Mick, over to you. Thank you. Okay, I'll share my screen. Can you see that okay? Yeah, that's great. And uh, sound check, is that still all right? Yep, still still hear you clearly, thanks. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I think I'm going to feel like a bit of a fraud here with uh, with Anna on, on the, the call as well, as the sort of leading authority in, in the UK on, on this, um, this disease that I'm going to talk about, chestnut blight. I'm sure um, I'd be happy to accept Anna jumping in and correcting me if I say anything wrong. Um, but, uh, but also, uh, if there are any questions about it, I'm, I'm relieved to have Anna here to help answer some of them. So um, I'll kick off. I'm going to talk about this uh, disease, chestnut blight. As John said at the start, it's, um, although it, it's, it is here, um, it's in the UK, and it's first been found in 2011. <clears throat> um, it it's, could be on the increase. Um, and again, we're looking, we're looking for people to, to report uh, be on the lookout for symptoms and report it. Um, I'm going to give you, you a quick background of, of the of the disease um, in 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 the UK and and beyond. Um, look at the life cycle and symptoms, and then I'm going to attempt to talk about the phenomenon of the naturally occurring hypervirus, which can be used in some circumstances to control or to manage chestnut blight. Um, and then I'm going to give a brief update on remorum, but I'll, I'll pause in between so that there's a, a chance to, um, to ask questions. I think that's the best thing to do. So without further ado then, um, the background of um, chestnut blight, it's a, a fungal pathogen caused by the, uh, the fungus Cryphonectria parasitica, um, and it primarily affects, as you would expect with the name, chestnut species, so Castanea species, especially Castanea dentata, the American chestnut, and then sort of next on the list in terms of susceptibility is um, our European uh, Castanea sativa, European chestnut. Um, it's had a devastating impact in, in the US. Um, it's been present there for uh, about 100 years, um, and it's, it's, it's all but wiped out their native American chestnut, um, the, the chestnut that remains there is, is just sprouts really, just, just um, not, not trees anymore, they're just, just um, regenerating stumps. Um, and it has also had a, a significant in, impact in Europe um, and it continues to affect uh, sweet chestnut trees in, um, in, uh, in, in mainland Europe. Uh, we've been undertaking surveys in the UK, the Forestry Commission has been taking surveys in the UK since 2006 for this um, pathogen. Um, and like I said, it was 2011 when it was first detected in the UK. Um, native to East Asia, 
um, but it's been introduced, as I say, to several times uh, across the world into America and into, into Europe. Um, and it's present in the UK. Um, in terms of the, uh, the spread and the, uh, the, the speed of spread through Europe, it's been relatively slow. Um, so it was first detected in the 1930s in northern Italy, um, but it's, it's had several points of introduction as indicated by those, those red arrows of the known points of introduction into um, various parts of mainland Europe. Um, and it spread slowly across the continent. And like I say, in 2011, it first cropped up in, um, in the UK. Um, since 2011, um, there's been around 60 findings of chestnut flight in the UK, um, uh, all in England, as far as I know. Um, and they're in a variety of contexts. So that that um, those those dots on the map are all the all the known um, findings, um, and including nursery uh, findings as well. Um, and the original findings in 2011 were all associated with orchard planting, so trees planted for growing chestnuts to eat. Um, so they were uh, grafts that were brought in from um, Europe, and that's that's how, although they they come in. Um, on a plant passport, um, and they they were they were symptomatic and they were they were infected. Um, and generally, they were at low levels. So early, the early findings were associated with these orchard plantings. And in 2000, end of 2016, um, there was the first findings in woodland associated with forestry planting stock, um, and they were principally in the southwest. Um, but they were associated with 90s and early 2000s planting of, of chestnut material. Um, and the majority of those sites, there was very little spread from, from, the, from the, uh, the affected trees. So they may have been in the ground for um, up to 20 or so years, but there had been almost no spread from, from most of the sites. Um, into the surrounding into the surrounding woods, so that the trees had just sort of sat there, and they, a lot of them were still alive, um, but they were there were relatively few um, that were infected, and and it didn't look to have spread on on the majority of sites, um, and they've all been subject to eradication and containment action under a statutory plant health notice. Uh, later findings in southeast, so particularly southeast London, indicated there was a more sort of established population of, of chestnut blight present, more established um, outbreak. Um, and it was a, in a different sort of context. They generally were in um, mature woodland, um, parkland and uh, roadside tree settings. Um, and they presented different challenges in terms of management. Um, so that, I think that's all I want to say on that slide. So looking at the, uh, <clears throat> the, the life cycle and the symptoms itself, it's a wound pathogen. So it, it affects um, uh, trees that have been wounded um, and it will, that's where, where the point of entry um, where the spores will, will germinate and become a problem. Um, it's an ascomycete, uh, so the same uh, group of fungi as ash dieback. Um, it can cause mortality of, of sweet chestnut. Um, often, though, the, the, the trees will continue to, to sort of limp on with the symptoms um, and not, not necessarily keel over and die. Um, but there are other hosts as well. So it's not just chestnut that, that, that can be hosts. Oak species and other um, other species can be incidental hosts as well. So generally, where there's high levels of chestnut infection, um, you get some collateral effect in other species, um, which can, in some occasions, sort of act as act as reservoirs of um, of spores. Um, it's not damaging particularly to 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 um, any other host other than other than chestnut, but it's just the the, the additional challenges this, this 
uh, gives you in terms of management because you could have a, a resident population um, nearby in a different species. Um, I mentioned at the start this, this hypervirulence. I'll try and talk about that briefly at the end of this. Um, but yes, it's a naturally occurring hypervirus uh, which can be introduced um, and can be used and is used in, in Europe to some effect to, to, manage the, to manage the disease. The key symptoms that uh, we're looking for are these, are these fissured cankers, so these ugly um, uh, cankers on the, on the stem. You get swollen um, and distorted uh, stems. <clears throat> And you get this the flagging of, um, of foliage, so fo affected foliage on the branches can die and go brown, and then that draws your attention to, um, an, uh, to, to an area of, of, of decline. And then when you investigate it, you often find one of these cankers which has caused it. And you also get epicormic growth, which I'll show you some pictures of. Um, and as you can see in the picture here, you get these pinhead sized rooting bodies associated with these large cankers. Um, they can be small, but in this case it's a large canker. But uh, yes, fairly, um, fairly uh, conspicuous in terms of how they appear. Um, that particular tree was almost glowing orange, I would describe it. I think I spotted it from, from um, some distance away. Um, but they're not always that obvious. Um, and then under the bark, you get these buff-coloured mycelial fans, which are, can, which are a sort of diagnostic of, of Cryphonectria in chestnut. Um, so I'll show you lots of pictures now. Um, but briefly, I'll just talk about the, uh, the life cycle. Um, I mentioned it was an ascomycete, um, and it produces airborne spores, but it only produces airborne spores when it's able to sexually reproduce. Um, and in order to do that, you need two different mating types, a mating type one and there's a mating type two. You need both to be present um, in order for the, uh, these airborne spores to be produced. And in this country, we haven't seen evidence of um, uh, sexual reproduction and these, these aerial spores being, being produced. Not, ne not necessarily to say that that hasn't happened, but we haven't found evidence of that. The majority of the sites that have been picked up <coughs> have um, been moved around with asexual reproduction. So these canidia are the other types of spores that are, that are produced asexually. Um, and they are a lot slower to move around. They're waterborne um, and they don't float around, but they can be potentially moved around by animals and things. Um, but primarily it's rain splash and, um, uh, and rain movement. Um, the, a moisture movement that will move these uh, canidia around. Um, obviously, you get an infected tree. The canker then produces the, the, the spores, or the fruiting body produces the spores on the canker, and then the spores then, um, if they come into contact with a wound on, a, on another tree or on the same tree somewhere else, then it will start a new infection and, and initiate a new canker, and the, and the cycle continues. So a quick look at some of the cankers. Um, it looks different um, at different life stages of the trees. So in the early years of a, uh, when a chestnut's young, um, very young, the, the symptoms don't show up at all. So low, below about four or five years old, um, it's unusual to see canker symptoms developing. It could be that there's latent infection in these younger trees. Once they get to um, this four, four to five year old stage, um, with nice green smooth bark, they show up, like I say, a very bright orange brown colour, um, not particularly fissured or, or swollen, but um, it's more the colour at this stage which, uh, which is the most obvious feature. As the trees get older um, and uh, into some pole stage uh, chestnuts, um, you would normally have still have smooth bark, and then these cankers become really obvious then. Um, where you get flaking and, and distortion of the, of the stem. And I don't know if you can see on the right hand picture there, those two trees in the middle, there is sort of orange hue to them, which is, um, as, I, as I described earlier on, they sort of glow in certain lights, um, if, you, if you see them at the, at the right angle. 
as the trees get older, the cankers get harder to spot. Um, so the, the, the natural fissuring of the bark starts to try starts to sort of disguise the, the cankers there. But you can see on the left there's there's two reasonably obvious cankers on that stem on the left and one at the fork in the in the in the tree on the right. Um, and you will get a bit of swelling as well on the stem, um, which can be an indicator that there's uh, uh, that there's canker there. I mentioned this epicormic growth, that's really just shoots, it's sort of a, a, a response of the tree to, to stress in effect, it's, it's being put under stress, it's being almost pruned at that point, so it starts to send out these, um, uh, these, these side shoots as a stress reaction. <clears throat> um, not necessarily a direct consequence of the, of, of the disease, it's more a reaction of the, of the tree to the presence of the disease. Um, but it can be a useful feature in terms of spotting a cankers because you, you see this profusion of shoots and then it draws your eye to um, to the sort of correct point on the on the stem to look for a, to look for a canker. And then when the trees do get mature, it becomes really difficult to spot the cankers. Um, uh, but the epicormic growth is what what. Uh, you, you can use in those circumstances to, to alert you to a tree that's under stress. Unhelpfully, um, chestnut tends to do this rather a lot anyway. Um, so you do get perfectly healthy trees with lots of epicormic growth. Um, but something you can check is at the base of this epicormic growth, if, if any of it is dying off, then you can sometimes see the, the orange um, cankers on the epicormic growth itself. And sometimes as well, you'll, you'll see um, the orange fruiting bodies um, sort of poking between the cracks of the of the mature bark, and this is the the flagging symptom that I talked about. You get a, a shoot that dies, um, and then when when you look close more closely at it, you, you can go and investigate and look more closely. And if you look down the down the further back down the shoot, often times you'll find an associated canker. Um, so that's just a useful uh, sort of feature to look out for. And of course, <clears throat> dieback. Um, these are these are actually pictures from um, from some of the sites in in southeast London. Um, so you can see where dieback is occurring in the crown. But these trees are still alive. They've probably been infected for for some time, <clears throat> but uh, but they're, they're still alive. Anecdotally, the the, the picture on the right there, that's a tree next to a bus stop. The the, the tree officer for the council there said that um, he'd been removing dead wood from that tree for about 20 years. Um, not to say that it has been infected for 20 years, but it's, um, it's possible. Um, and if that, if that tree was sub subject to long-term infection, then again, it's still relatively full crown and, and relatively healthy, just with bits of, um, bits of dead branches sticking out. And under the under the uh, cankers, you, you get this characteristic mycelial fan. So if you, if you spot something like um, that you suspect might be chestnut blight, then something you can do is look underneath the bark for these these buff coloured um, mycelia, um, and and that can be fairly diagnostic. So that's off. Sometimes you will find these orange fruiting bodies associated with a different species of Cryphonectria, Cryphonectria radicalis. But you don't get this um, this buff coloured mycelial fan underneath, which is indicative of this chestnut-like causing pathogen. And that's just me showcasing my amazing photography skills um, through a hand lens on the right. You can see they're quite pretty um, buff coloured uh, mycelial fans. <clears throat> and I mentioned the fruiting bodies. We've seen that photo before. Yes, really. Um, bright, vivid orange fruiting bodies, um, and they, how could I describe them? Well, the next photograph probably describes it better than I can um, say, but they, they, they erupt through from underneath the bark. They're not little bobbles that sit on top of the bark. Um, they, they, they push through from behind, um, and so that's, um, I guess that's the best way to describe it. There are various other sort of nectaria species that where you get little nice spherical red bobbles sitting on top of the um, on top of the bark, but, uh, but you get this sort of eruption occurring from underneath with, with chestnut blight. Um, it doesn't just affect 
live material, it can affect dead material. This is a photograph from one of the sites which is subject to eradication action. Um, and initially, uh, we specified the, the killing of the, the stumps with glyphosate. Um, and this may have actually promoted the, the colonization of these stumps by, um, by, the, uh, by the fungus. And so you can see that there is a profusion of, um, uh, of fruiting bodies on these, on these stools. Um, and also it was, it was affecting the sapwood as well. So it's not just on the bark, but it was on the, on the sapwood. And the, the thinking, I mean, Anna can probably put me right on this, but I think the thinking is that by killing the stumps, we, we, yeah, the, 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 the natural defences of the, of the tree were, were removed, and therefore it, it, was, it was a perfect um, sort of uh, platform for the disease to, to, to take hold and, and, and reproduce. I would say that, I guess, it, as it producing these waterborne spores um, it's probably still less of a risk than the than the, the tree with its cankers wafting around in the in the air um, because it's so close to the ground. But um, these this this was um, obviously subject to monitoring, um, and the, uh, um, the the decision was taken on this particular site to um, and, and some other sites that were similarly affected to go down a a uh, a charring sort of. Um, a, a flame treatment, effectively a flame thrower, so it's a sort of um, uh, a roofing style um, burner, propane gas burner, was used to char the stumps and to burn them off. And this is, Anna gave it the, the, the nickname Phoenix Fungus because even after this this uh, subjected to, to high levels of, uh, of heat and charring, you can still see some of those fruity bodies actually coming back there. Um, so they were subsequently burned again um, and, uh, and that, that, that had a, a less recovery there was, there was less fungal recovery in that, in that case um, but yeah it just shows how resilient this um, this this fungus can be and in terms of other observations in the UK um, I won't get into the detail of oriental chestnut gall wasp but there's another invasive species affecting chestnut in this country um, which is a, a little wasp which creates galls uh, on buds um, and in the winter these these buds are sorry the galls look like this they're little woody woody galls um, and in 2020 Anna and and her team uh, isolated uh, chestnut blight from these galls associated with the, with the oriental chestnut gall wasp um, and there's a link to the uh, to the paper that, that or the, the the research note that was produced at the time. Um, it's a known phenomenon that there's an interaction between chestnut blight and this uh, oriental chestnut gall wasp, but it was it was actually noticed for the first time in, in London um, on on some of these um, affected sites. Okay, so. That's the easy bit done. I'll try and explain now this this hypervirus, and Anna, I'm sure, will will um, put me right if I if I stray far from the path. I'll try and explain it in simple terms as I as I understand it. There is a a hyper a, a, a naturally occurring virus. So the, the the disease itself is caused by a fungus, Cryptomyxia parasitica, and there is a naturally occurring virus which affects the fungus and makes it less virulent. Um, so it reduces its ability to reproduce and it reduces its aggressiveness on, on the host. Um, and the picture on the left there is a, is a non-hypovirulent canker, so a, a, an active canker without the presence of the hypervirus. And the picture on the right is a uh, a canker which is in effect is healed because the, the hypervirus has, has had this effect and, and, uh, and knocked, that, knocked out the fungus but there's still a um, there's still a mark on the stem but otherwise that 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 fungus that, that canker and the fungus is no longer active there so you don't get the fruiting bodies um, and um, and it, it doesn't continue to um, to impact on the health of the tree and it is used to some effect in Europe as a as a control method, um, and 
particularly on, in the orchard situation. So there's a much bigger industry associated with uh, the production of chestnuts for eating in, in Europe, in France. Um, and the orchards with this annual cash crop are able to um, uh, apply um, hypervirulent strains of the fungus to um, active cankers and, <clears throat> and, and actually promote their healing. And then once the hypervirus is applied to a canker, um, if there's any reproduction that occurs, the hypervirus is carried in, in the spores that are produced, these canidia, these waterborne spores. Um, and then if those sp spores come into contact with another canker, then it can have this um, same healing effect and, and in effect the, the virus then spreads through the population of the fungus. I hope I'm still making sense. Um, so it is used to some effect. There are drawbacks because as you can imagine, going through and identifying every canker, um, it's, I guess it's hard enough in an orchard situation where you have low, well-spaced trees with low spreading crowns that are easily accessible. Um, and uh, there are a number of ways you can apply the, the hypervirus. Um, in this case, on the left, they, they use cork borers around the edge of the canker, and then you, you pop in plugs of, um, uh, of, of active hypervirulent cryphonectia to the, to the canker. Um, and the, the guy on the right, not necessarily adhering to the most stringent health and safety, but it demonstrates the, um, the difficulties associated with applying this in a, in a, uh, in a forest situation. Um, they have the interesting. There is a paper um, on uh, on how to, on on the, the relative success of applying um, hypervirulent strains of cryptonectria with a gun and shooting cankers. Which I think, if there are any trials planned for that, uh, I can volu I'd volunteer for that. Um, like I said, it's a possible long-term tool, um, and. It's not a silver bullet because there are lots of um, lots of hurdles to overcome. Um, not least the the careful licensing which would be required to actually use this hypervirus in in this country as a as a, as a long term management tool. But it but it is something which is a possibility in the future. Anna and her team have found the hypervirus naturally occurring in in the UK in some of the isolates of chestnut bite which have been found. But it's only managed, they've only managed to, 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 um, to detect it in a very small number of isolates, um, which suggests that um, one, again, the, 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 the actual fungus itself has been here um, probably a long time um, in term, um, for the hypervirus to become established. But also, um, I can't remember what I was going to say for number two, but it was, I'm sure it was important. Uh, the, it might come back to me. I've made the point about it being difficult to apply to mature trees, um, but, but yeah, in terms of a, an application um, to a forest situation, it would be very difficult. Um, and, the, and its effectiveness is determined by, its genetic, by the genetic population of the number of strains, different strains of, of cryphonectria that are present. So, uh, in the UK, there have been a number of separate introductions, which might mean that the hypervirus is, if we are able to introduce it, um, might struggle to spread through naturally through the populations. So it might require um, quite intensive work to, uh, to for it to be successful. But hopefully, I stumbled my way through the hypervirus. Um, part of the talk without sounding like a complete idiot. Um, just to remind you of the three main um, symptoms, these fissured cankers, the orange fruiting bodies, and the mycelial fans under the bark. And if you do suspect that you've seen any, uh, any, any of these symptoms, then please do report it via tree alert. Um, there, are, there is more information available, there's loads of information on the Forest Research websites, um, on the EPO website, um, and there's a nice little short video as well, which was produced by some of um, Anna's colleagues in Macedonia, 
if you're really interested, that paper at the bottom is a really useful uh, summary paper which explains everything in, in much more detail than I've been able to do here. So that's me for chestnut flight. Um, shall I try and end the slideshow? And All right. There are Thank questions. You, Hopefully, Anna can help. Uh, got a couple of questions that, that have come in, so I'll invite the, the people who are asking the questions to unmute themselves and ask. Um, Shona Morton, would you like to ask your question? Hi Mick, thanks for that. Um, I was just wondering if timber quality is affected in chestnut by the cankers or if it's just the case that growth slows right down and or the trees cark it? Um, a, bit of, a bit of both. I would say that the the cankers are a distortion of the stem, so they, they will cause a a, a, um, a a problem in terms of timber quality, but it will also affect the vigour and, and, and trees. But it's um, but yeah, bit of both. Thank you. Just a follow on question from me about that. Is there any restriction on the sale and movement of infected timber? Uh, yes, there's a since 2013 there have been um, there's a pre-notification requirement for imports of of sweet chestnut um, into the country. If there's a finding on on a site, then it would be subject to containment measures. Um, so chestnut and oak would be restricted um, and subject to it would be subject to, to licensing to move, move material from those sites, but in general, um, that hasn't been something which has, which has happened um, from, from the, the, the sites that have been affected so far. And in most cases, it's been burnt on site. Okay, thank you. Uh, and there was a question from quite near the start from Rupert Lane. Rupert, I'll invite you to. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering what time of year the um, fruiting bodies are, are visible. All year round. I think they're more prevalent in the in the summer, but the canidia uh, can be produced at all all times of year. But yeah, um, probably more in the spring and the summer. But um, it was first picked up in January in in on on, a, on the site that I'm thinking of. There was definitely um, fruiting bodies in January, so all year round. Okay. Great. Thank you. So there's no more questions. Well, there's there's one about an internal FC IT issue, but we won't go into that uh, in um, in any detail. Um, so yeah, I think unless anyone's got any more questions they want to just chip in with, um, we can yet yeah, jump back to you, Mick, to, uh, to take us on to the third part of today's talk. Can Mick just try moving further or closer to the microphone? Because I, I had a feeling that made it a bit better when he was closer. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's. I the will. I will. I will I've, I've got a new webcam, especially for this this um, presentation. So um, I will. I will disable that and see if that makes any difference. Can you hear me now? Is that any better? The sound is better, but you're now quite quiet. <laughs> okay. Try the uh, on headset. Okay, third time lucky. I'm sure this one this one will do it. How's that? That's I think that's the best yet. <laughs> Still not perfect. Okay. I'll I'll see what I can do. The next time. Just the next time. Okay, you'll have to put up with me staring at my screen and looking away from the camera, but hopefully too annoying for people. Uh, right, let's share my screen. Can you all see that? Uh, yep, that's good. Just a okay. uh, presentation view. Oh, am I not in presentation view? Oh, it just needs to go on the slideshow. It's... If 
if you're working on two screens, Mick, I think it's I think you're sharing. Okay. All right. Then. Okay. Whilst whilst you're doing it, I just if people just put into the chat whether they prefer Mick from the Chestnut Talk or Mick now, which is clearer but a bit quieter. If we just have a a few a few people just chip into the comment like before or now. I I personally would say it's better now. Oh, okay. We're getting a pretty a, a split there, pretty even. I'll shout. I'll shout. That's good. I think, yeah. Can you see the screen now? We can. I've got a perfect slideshow. Good. Okay. I will. I've now got, I've now got three screens open. So, if, can you see that if I cycle through like that? Yep. Yeah, that's flicking through. Fine. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about the uh, technical issues. Uh, so, Phytophthora remorum. Um, I'm going to give a brief update on uh, on Phytophthora remorum. Uh, it's been a very busy year for Phytophthora this year. Um, just to remind everyone, this is a, a highly destructive plant pathogen. Um, it's, it's notifiable and there's been a, an aerial survey program undertaken since 2010 uh, to, uh, to survey for this disease. It affects numerous host species, um, including um, prim primarily larch species and rhododendron, um, but it has lots of other host species as well, both forestry species and ornamental and heathland species, such as uh, bilberry. Um, so it can affect uh, different habitat types. And like I say, it's, uh, for this reason, it's subject to annual surveillance and statutory action. The hosts we've got shown there on the left hand side, we've got these, this um, large tree showing bright orange brown foliage, which is typical of, of dieback caused by Phytophthora remorum. Uh, we've got rhododendron infection at the bottom um, and Beech bleed, black bleeding on beech trees, which are commonly found in association with infected rhodo or larch. Um, a particular issue in the southwest is sweet chestnut infection. So chestnut again, copying it from Phytophthora remorum as well as chestnut blight. And then that's um, in the bottom right there. It's infected uh, vaccinium, so bilberry species. Um, and then there's a little picture of the two different types of spores that produce. Uh, these these uh, sporangia containing the, the, the swimming zoospores spores and the the rounder, small spherical uh, spore is the chlamydia spore, which is the resting spore which can remain active in the soil for um, a number of years. Uh, so very brief overview of what we're dealing with. Um, I'm going to give you an update from the, the survey programme this year. So 2020... As I mentioned, it's been a very busy year for Phytophthora remorum, um, probably uh, due to conducive weather in 2019. Uh, in terms, so it was wet, wet and warm um, in, in, in periods at the right periods in 2019. This is our aerial survey summary. The bright orange shows the, the natural the, the national forest inventory that has been surveyed uh, this year. In comparison with 2019, we actually managed uh, significantly more coverage. Um, we had uh, multiple outbreaks of oak processionary moth in 2019, which we had to uh, factor into our, our surveys. Luckily, it was not a busy year for remorum in 2019. Um, we had delays at the start of the season uh, due to COVID-19, um, and we had to make... Uh, adaptations to the, to the aircraft. It's normally done from a helicopter with three crew on board, three Forestry Commission employees on board um, and a pilot. But due to social distancing requirements, we had to put a bulkhead in and just do it with a single crew man and photographer. So that led to um, capacity issues. Um, and it, I guess it, it would have reduced, I guess, our effectiveness to a certain extent because we only had one set of eyes staring out at the helicopter. 
But despite that, we still managed 20 flights over the season in terms of England coverage, over 34,000 hectares of larch was surveyed and roughly 50-50 split between public forest and private woodland. Um, and if you look at our um, how much woodland we actually covered in that period, um, it's nearly 800,000 hectares, which is 60% of England's woods. So we got, we got good coverage um, compared with uh, 2019. But unfortunately, there has been lots of findings this year, uh, or rather 2020, so that this survey year. Um, generally, there's been an expansion of, of Remorum. Um, we've got 255 positive sites, um, which roughly equates to about a thousand, just well, over a thousand hectares of larch, which, is, um, which has been affected. And that's the highest amount in terms of area coverage that we've had since the, uh, the programme began in, in 2000 and I think, well, 2011 was our, was our last time we, we, we had such high uh, levels of infection. So it is a real um, spike. Um, we've had infected larch and sweet chestnut observed in, in new areas, new geographic areas, um, most notably the East Midlands. So we've had uh, heavy infection in areas of the Peak District. Um, and so you can see the, the red uh, squares in the middle there, <coughs> showing this, this new, new areas of infection. We've also had intense symptoms and mortality in the Northwest, so primarily in the Lake District, but Lancashire also. So high levels of infection up there. Further down south, um, although it's higher than it has been in recent years in the southwest, uh, the, the number of findings in the area affected is not as bad. So the majority of the findings were up north. Um, there have been local hotspots and gen generally sporadic findings across the southwest and southeast, um, but there's, there's, there's various hotspots. The other notable areas of new geographic spread are, you see that dot in the, in the Welsh marches and um, findings this year, there's been multiple findings in the Forest of Dee. Um, so the Welsh marches have, have so far over the last decade managed, we've never had a, a finding in Larch in there. So that's a, 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 a significant development and there's, there's quite a lot of Larch in, in those Welsh marches as well. Um, and similarly, we've or colleagues in, in Scotland and Wales have observed a similar increase um, and that may be associated or that those, those Welsh marches and Forest of Dean findings may be associated with the increase in, in findings across the border in Wales. <clears throat> Excuse me. And finally, um, uh, for the second year running, we've had an increase in the observed levels of the bark beetle Ips Simbri, which are briefly talk about at the end of this um, uh, of my slides. Just to show you some photographs from the survey activity. Um, this is a site in the East Midlands. All the grey brown trees in the middle are um, unfortunately infected larch. Um, there was an association on a lot of these sites with uh, infected rhododendron. So either uh, there's been rhododendron there that's been an infection bubbling away and it undetected uh, or there's been an actual documented history of infection in rhododendron at, at some of these sites. Um, so that was a, a significant uh, factor we think in, well it's always been a significant factor and it, it, it always um, pays to remind people that rhododendron is, the, is one of the things that's driving this epidemic um, and if you have rhododendron underneath larch or near larch, then it's, um, it's an accident waiting to happen. So I would urge people to take up the, the, uh, the, the tree health grant to clear the rhododendron um, before it becomes a problem. Um, but that photo on the right there, you can see the, 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 the larch is affected, the thin crowns and, or absent crowns, and then this rhododendron underneath it, which is showing signs of infection. I mentioned this high levels of mortality in the northwest. So sadly, this is um, in the Lake District, um, Grisdale. 
um, again, high levels of, of LARP infection. So it's, it's reminiscent for those of you who, who uh, sort of lived through the, uh, the, 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 the high levels of infection in the Southwest back in 2010, 11, 12. Um, this is this is uh, reminiscent of that sort of landscape scale um, uh, damage, unfortunately. This is probably the worst site in the southwest. Um, it's obviously completely cooked. Uh, the larch in there is, is completely, almost completely dead. Um, that's wouldn't say that that was typical of the southwest, but that is one of the cases. So it, again, indicating that there has been a high level of infection. Um, this year. The next photo is, is more typically what we've seen across the southwest. So generally smaller numbers of trees affected, not the whole lot. Um, but unfortunately, these sites will still be subject to statutory action. And a lot of those green trees will have to be felled because many of them will be harboring latent infection. Um, due to the uh, the, I guess the difficulties um, and the, the amount of larch that was that was under um, that was being picked up by the aerial surveys. Um, we normally do a dedicated sweet chestnut flight at least one, um, but this year we haven't managed to do a dedicated sweet chestnut flight. Um, but we have still picked up um, evidence of, of of infection. So. You can see the larch is obviously struggling there and, and, and highly sort of symptomatic. This was a site in Dorset. Um, but adjacent to that, you can see decline in, like I've circled there in the, in the slide, of, of sweet chestnut crowns as well, which is also a sporulating host and subject to statutory action. Um, we're hoping to do a more thorough look at sweet chestnut again next year. But, um, but like I say, it's, we've, we've only got a certain amount of capacity, we were re reduced in our crew numbers and, and we had a, a, a smaller survey season due to the adaptations required in the aircraft as well. So we were, we were really up against it this year. Um, and finally, this Ips Sembri. So next week, I believe Max Blake is going to talk to you about the notifiable um, eight-toothed spruce bark beetle, Ips typographus. Um, this is a related species. It's not notifiable. It's not. Um, it's not subject to statutory action in this country. Um, but we do tend to find a small number of sites each year during the Phytophthora um, surveys that are affected by this large, large bark beetle, beetle Ipsembri. Um, and this year, in particular, there's there's been a, a, a big uptick in the amount of of sites um, that have been affected. It's been present in the country since the 50s, and we know about isolated populations in the Forest of Dean, for example, um, but it's normally a secondary pest, and it normally only affects stressed trees, um, and uh, it only becomes a problem for healthy trees when the populations get, get very large. The, the recent warm summers that have been good for insects in general. Um, so contributing to the to the oak processionary moth um, uptick that we've seen um, has also had impacts on other um, pest populations. And so this may be a, a this, this increase in findings in Ipsembri is probably associated with that. Um, these are the sort of symptoms that we were, we were observing from the air. So this was a site in the Forest of Dean, which, as far as we can tell, is not infected with Phytophthora remorum, but those trees that are otherwise healthy are being attacked by, um, by this Ipsembri beetle. And the map on the right shows the distribution of, of these sites which, have observed, which we've observed um, Ips in. Um, so that's something that uh, we are looking at with forest research um, and are hoping to, to investigate this more um, to see if this is likely to become more of a problem. The thinking is that it's, it's a, a, a natural increase um, and one of the, the sort of fluctuations of population um, associated with the, with the warmer weather that we've had um, and um, that, it, that it won't necessarily become a, 
uh, when they went to start to attack help, healthy trees on a, on a wide scale. Um, the majority of those findings that we've had were, have been small numbers of trees affected and, and trees that, that are stressed due to other conditions as well. In some cases, we have found both on the same site. So we found Phytophthora and Ips affecting, in some cases, the same tree. Um, so it can make it difficult from a survey perspective. Um, but we're also working with forest research to look at any potential interaction between the two, um, the two pests. So that's me very briefly. Uh, more resources on Phytophthora on the forest research web pages. Um, there, is, there are summary reports from England, Scotland and Wales that are available on that link there. On the, if, you're, if you're interested in Phytophthora remorum, I suggest you sign up to the California Oak Mortality Task Force um, newsletter. Um, and in the latest newsletter, there's, there's, there's updates from England, Scotland and Wales all in one place. Um, and there's really, really good symptoms guides available on the observatory website. Um, which are available as downloadable PDFs, so they can that you can download them to your to your uh, your tablet or your phone and have them with you. And it's not just Remorum. I'll plug Observatory. They do lots of lots of good symptoms guides, which can be found in the same place. That is me. That's really great. Thank you, Mick. Um, quick question from Chris. Don't have a surname. Um, Chris, would you like to? Unmute yourself and, and ask your question. If not, I can't hear you, Chris, but uh, I'll, I'll ask the question in your stead. After the clearance of infected larch in the southwest over the past 15 years, how much do we have left standing? Um, that's a good question. I mean, the majority of the, the larch that's left in the southwest is um a small component so that i would say most of the the, the pure stands of, of larch have been removed not all of them um north devon there are still some still some sizable um stands of of, of of larch remaining in terms of proportion i i've got to be honest i don't know off the top of my head um so i can try and answer that and come back to you if that's helpful but there is still enough left to uh, to survey to need to survey. I think is probably the uh... yeah. There's a significant amount of larch. I mean, the the, the reason, uh, as a lot of people probably know, because larch um, has autumn colour. It's planted as a it has an aesthetic um, quality and it's a useful timber uh, tree in its own right. So it's planted often as a small component of a lot of woodlands. So that there is there is larch. Um, in in a lot in, in across the, the whole of the southwest still great thank you mick uh, there was a question from anthony trollop blue which was partially answered but i think it's still worth asking and expanding upon so anthony would you like to pose your question yeah it's something i read in the press that a a fungus that attacks beech trees had been discovered in central europe if i remember rightly slovenia I've heard nothing more about it, but it just, this was just in the national press. I just wondered if you knew anything about it. Um, I wonder if that's the beech leaf disease. Anna might be able to jump in on that because I'm I'm not 100% sighted on it, to be honest. Anna, are you there? Yes, I am here. But do you mean the beech leaf disease? I don't know. It was just it was a very brief bit in in, in the. Daily Telegraph about a month ago, just saying that this fungus had been discovered in Central Europe that attacked uh, beech trees, and that's okay. all there was to it. Okay, it could be. It's called Petrarchia. Uh, I can send you a link uh, because I think we have uh, is some information already online. Uh, can I quickly check and I put the link in the forum or in the? Yeah. Comment yeah, Anna, uh, one of one of the other um, attendees has already put a, a link in to the Forestry Commission blog about Petrarchia. Petrarchia, so, yeah. So that okay, link is that's there. Okay, good. Yeah. good. Uh, but just yeah. to sort of expand that question slightly, I mean, is there a way that um, people can be looking at the diseases that are heading our way? Is there? 
where's the best place people can go to for for that sort of information okay there are different web pages where you can look for these things obviously uh we try from in the country we try to pick up uh, these new threats and we try to write about it but also you have a uh, death right? you have the uk register for example uh, that is from defra and you also have uh, the european plan protection organization epo uh, that i think is a very good uh, website as well to look for new threats at the moment, on beach trees, we have two different things because one is the fungus that uh, just has been mentioned, Petarchia, but also there is another uh, beach leaf disease caused by a nematode um, that has been in America. And uh, then it's because it's beach leaf disease, one is a fungus, one is a nematode. Then it may be a bit of confusion, but both things are in the horizon on beach. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so I think that was all of the questions uh, that we had from the chat. Um, and I'm very glad to say we've actually managed to keep one session to time now. So we are, I'm getting the hang of things finally. Um, oh, Lisa, you just raised your hand. Would you like to unmute yourself? And It's actually Steve, but oh. uh, Lisa's moved on. Um, just to say that some of us are not getting a chat option, so I don't know whether that's limiting the number of questions you're getting, but some of us cannot see the chat screen or access it at all. I don't know why that is. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry about that, folks. If anyone does have any questions, please feel free to email them through to me after the chat, and then I can put them to the guests, and we can share those. Uh, we've put together a question and answer from last week's session on Ash dieback and have circulated that in the e-alert. So hopefully that's uh, that's gone. Everyone will have received that. Um, if you haven't, contact the uh, central the mailbox for the Southwest region. We can add you to the e-alert and we can send you the last couple of editions. But like I say, if there are any questions that that you did want to ask that you haven't been able to, just get in touch and we will. Um, we will answer them. But yeah, so thank you uh, to Mick and th for doing a double shift today. Um, and thank you very much to Anna for, for your time as well and for joining us. Uh, thank you to Tracy for your help behind the scenes. Um, and yeah, if no more questions pop up in the next couple of seconds, I will bid you all a very, very good afternoon uh, and hope, yeah, hope to see you all next week. We've got one of these sessions left. Uh, and it's going to be focusing very much on beetles. Uh, we do hope also to have an update on uh, sudden oak death, acute oak decline. No, not sudden oak death, acute oak decline, chronic oak decline. Um, so there we go. So, yep, hopefully see you all next week. Thank you for coming. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.